But here we are, justified, week three. We've been in this series, this being our third week. And if you have missed any one of the first two weeks, I challenge you, go back online and listen to the messages. Pastor Rick did an amazing job last week unpacking the word there in the first part, middle part of chapter one. But just to do a little bit of review, what is the book of Romans or what is this justified series? It's a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. A lot of theologians believe it was a a lot of house churches. It was a church that he had yet to visit. And so you can read through the letter that he's excited about going to visit the church there in Rome. But the, the book has a theme. And the main theme of the book of Romans is the gospel. How to get right with God. What is the gospel? The gospel is simply the good news of Jesus coming to save humanity. That's good news. Amen, church? And here's the deal. As we are walking through the book of Romans, there's no way that we can cover every detail and every verse and every chapter. So I'm challenging you. I'm asking you to allow these conversations, allow these messages each weekend as we're walking through the book of Romans to be a springboard that springs forward into your devotional time. That you will find plans, you'll unpack the word of God for yourself. Because this is what I've learned. The only truth is really found in this book. And the more that we dive into it, the closer we can get to God. So just, I challenge you to do so. In this series, this justified series in the book of Romans, we would call it an, an exegetical series, which the opposite or a different type, and we do those at Christ Place, are topical series. We will walk through a topic or talk about a topic and look to Scripture to see what God wants to have or have, has to say on that topic. But in this series, we're just going to see what God's Word has to say line by line, verse by wor- verse. So we're just going to unpack God's Word. And it's going to be challenging. It's going to push up against some things. And we're going to dive into it today. Are you ready to dive in? Pray with me then. Father, we love you. God, thank you so much that in this moment, we are gathered together in this house of worship. We're gathered together online around a screen. So Holy Spirit, at this holy intersection of time, I'm just asking you, Father, that you'll anoint me as an imperfect man presenting a perfect gospel, this good news That you'll anoint the hearts and the ears of those that are here in the house and joining us online. That for the next few moments of time, God, we can unpack your word and see what it has to say for us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, I I understand uh, this morning that all of us come from different walks of life. Not all of our contexts are the same. Some of us grew up in church some of us did not grow up in church. Some of, some of us, this might be our first opportunity to be in church even today. But for my context or, or, or my story, I grew up in church. And I, whether it's true or not, it felt this way growing up in a pastor's home that every time the doors were open, I was there. It didn't matter what kind of event it was, it didn't matter what it didn't matter what was going on, we were there. Whether it was the women having an event, the men having an event, kids having an event, youth having an event, it, I was there. And when I look back on my time growing up in a, in a Christ following home or a Christian home, I don't look back and regret all of those times because if you knew me as a kid, it was probably a good thing that I was in church more often than not. Because, I mean, I could get in some trouble, especially growing up with deacons' kids. That's what we used to call executive leaders. And we'd get together and just have a little bit of fun. So, you know, that was me. So it was a good thing for me to be involved in church. At the same time, growing up in church, my viewpoint of God was not always on point. I would, I would say that my viewpoint of God was skewed in a, in a wrong direction, that I had some wrong perceptions of God because I had this perception and this deep-seated fear in my life that I could never measure up, that, that, that I was going to make mistakes and God was like this judge with this gavel and every time I would make a mistake, he would come down and the judgment of God, or the, the wrath of God would be upon my life. And these deep-seated fears 
was something in my life that I had to walk out as a teenager and as a young adult. These misconceptions of God was something that I had to deal with in my life. Maybe you can relate to, to what I'm saying this morning. Maybe you had the thought that you don't even fit in as a Christian or a Christ follower. Maybe you, you've had the thought that God is always angry and he's always hateful. And you've asked the question, why would I want to serve a God that's always angry or hateful? Maybe you view God as some cosmic killjoy and his Christians or his disciples are just simply a, a form of moral police that are trying to keep everyone from doing what they really want to do or having fun or having pleasure in this life. You know, as we have read in the book of Romans last week, Paul starts off in verse number 16 telling us about this gospel, that he's laying out this good news, and he's letting us know how that we need to get right with God, but I believe before we can get right with God, we've got to understand how we're not right with God. And so while he laid out the beginning of the gospel last week in verses 16 and 17, the scriptures that we're going to walk through today are going to show us the areas and how we're not right with God. We're going to read a lot of scripture. I want to unpack it for you today. But to, to quote the great preacher Terry Brown, he said, Jonathan, use a lot of scripture because that's really the only part of your message that you can guarantee is true. So we're going to read a lot of truth today. So Buckle in, let's go. If you have your Bibles, would you please turn with me to Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 18 and put your hands together if you believe God's word is alive. It has something to say to us today. I'll believe it. Let's start reading there in verse number 18. The word of God says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Who? By their unrighteousness, suppress the truth. Oh man, I want to go back to verses 16 and 17, the good news. Paul's launching into this wrath of God, talking about a <laughs> bummer subject to bring up at Easter or Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving dinner, this wrath of God. I'm telling you, why it might not be a perfect or awesome or exciting topic of conversation is something that we need to lean into. Because while God's savings righteousness was revealed in the gospel for those who trust in him and believe it, as we read last week, God's wrath is revealed against those who suppress the truth in the verses that we're walking through today. This word suppress jumps out. It actually means to hold down or to cover up. And Paul is saying you have covered up the truth. The Greek word means to hold a rudder against the current. So in essence, Paul is saying in, in verse 18 that by their wickedness, they are holding a rudder against the strong current of truth, this strong current of the gospel that is being presented to them. And by their choices, they choose to knowingly push back against the truth. Verse number 19 says this, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they so are. So they are without excuse. Paul is letting us know in this verse of scripture that the evidence of God is everywhere. That physical creation is the visible disclosure. It's the visible evidence of an invisible God. And it begs the question that how can we truly ignore the divine creation of God when it is right in front of us. But human, humanity tries to do it all the time. They try to explain away the truths that are so clearly in front of us 
with theory after theory after theory trying to tell us that this was not divinely created, that we were not divinely created by a heavenly God that loves us. If there's no divine creation, think about this just for a moment. That this all just happened by happenstance. I'm not a doctor, I, I, I'm not a scientist, but I did read this to be true. The simplest cell known to man, think about this just for a moment, has more than 100,000 moving parts performing a thousand complex activities every second and there's no divine creator behind creation? I mean, if we go down that path believing that there's no divine creator behind the creation, it would kind of be like this. It would kind of be like throwing a, a, a bomb falling on into a mountain and exploding and all of a sudden pops out the most technologically advanced jet plane you've ever seen with all the gadgets known to man. And not only is this jet plane produced from this bomb, the jet plane starts producing baby jets. And they call us crazy that believe that we have a divine creator behind creation? When the creation that is all in front of us is the physical evidence of an invisible God. Yet with all of the creation shouting of the evidence of the creator, they still chose to suppress the truth in their own hearts. Verse number 21 says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their, their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. In the context of Paul presenting the gospel to the Romans, there was a lot of images carved out of wooden or wood resembling birds and animals. And I, and I understand that we don't see a lot of those today. There's still some in our context or in our world today. But notice this word exchange. They traded the glory of God for images. When the creation is worshipped rather than the creator, we are now opening up our lives to making these things in our lives that we choose to worship idols in our lives. It's actually a reversal. Instead of us as men being created in God's image, we now as men, are, men and women are creating gods in our own image. While we might not have uh, wooden carven images in our lives or in our houses or in our offices or wherever, we see a lot of things in our culture today that is being worshipped other than the creator. People worship their identity instead of God. People choose to worship money. People choose to, choose to worship pleasure instead of God. People, we see it all the time. Choose to worship power. We even see it today that people choose to worship themselves. But scripture calls the worship of anyone or anything other than Jesus idolatry. Paul's not done. I told you, here we go. Let's keep going. Verse 24. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. So Paul's like, all right, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna suppress the truth. You're going to push back of the truth that is right in front of you. God's response is this. He let them go to chase their own desires. It's free will, but free will comes with consequences when we choose wrongly. Verse 25 because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who, ble who is blessed forever. Amen. They knew the truth. But in, in spite of that, they, they chose to believe a lie. They knew it was a lie, but they, 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 they chose to believe it anyways. And when we carve out our own gods in our own, own lives, then we're the ones that's choosing right from wrong. 
And when you choose to do this, we have to live with the consequences. I mean, Paul's laying the gospel out of there, out here to everyone. He's saying, you have suppressed the truth. You have chosen to believe and serve a lie. And Paul's not even done yet. He's just getting started. Now he's going to go into a full list of sins that I believe are just simply symptoms of these people exchanging the truth for a lie. This is what happens when we exchange a truth for the lie. So continue reading me in verse number 26. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now before we continue on, in reading verses 26 through 27, some people try to only point out these as a basis for judging people that are walking through these things in their lives, these sins. Maybe you're here today and you have felt beaten over the head from a judgment standpoint or self-righteous platform, but that's not Paul. what Paul's doing here. He's just not isolating or pointing out one thing. There's a full list. Verse number 28 says this, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. All manner of unrighteousness. Evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. I doubt Paul was getting any amens either that day. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful. Inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. I've heard that one quoted to me several times. <laughs> Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Verse 32. Though they knew, though they know God's righteous decree, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Paul's Paul's saying you're, you're not only walking through these things and openly doing them and suppressing the truth and believing a lie and worshiping the creation over the creator, you're encouraging other and approving of other people doing the same. He'd been addressing those who were openly going in the opposite direction of God up till this point. And before, when he wrote the letter, it was not broken up into to, to chapters. So I want to continue reading there in chapter number two, because up to this point, he had been addressing the Greeks or the Gentiles, the non-Jews that were in Rome. And if there was any Jews in the congregation that day, they were probably feeling pretty good about themselves. They, they might have been the ones that were saying amen. You get them, Paul. You tell them how they're, 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 they're away from God. You tell them where they're messing up. But I've learned of reading God's word, Paul's not going to leave anyone out. Continue reading there in verse number one. It says, therefore you, now he's talking to the Jews. Oh man, every one of you who judges for in passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, Practice the very same things. Maybe that doesn't hit you the way it hits me. They're feeling pretty good, and then he's like, actually, no, no, you're not. Verse 2 says, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, That you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? 
Yes, Paul had walked through all of these things and in presenting the gospel. And last week we talked about what he's not ashamed and what he's eager to present. And now he's talking about the wrath of God, how we are not right with God. In a lot of ways, Paul was presenting the gospel in the form of a court case as the prosecutor. He's laying it out there. And he includes all of us. There's, there's at least three groups of people present that day. We see that in the scriptures that we just read, the wicked are there, the rebellious, those that suppress the truth. The godless are present. They have no respect for God. They think this is all a joke. They serve the lie and serve the creation over the creator. And then we had the religious, the proud, those that are judging those who they think that they're better than. But if we here that are present today in the house or online, if we're honest with ourselves, at one point in our lives, if not today, another time in our life, we could find ourselves in one of these three groups of people. This gospel, this good news, yes, is good news for those that trust in it, but those that rebel against it, there's things that are going to happen in those people's lives as well. And as we're walking through this book of Romans, I believe there's some biblical truths that we can glean and walk away with today. I believe there's some takeaways, some tangible things that we can learn from what Paul is walking through today in verses 18 through 32 and then on into chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So I want to give you three simple takeaways before we leave that we can learn from the scriptures that we've just walked through. So number one, if you're taking notes, guess what? You want to know who's guilty? We're all guilty. God's wrath is the response of his holiness to wickedness and rebellion. We have to know that we are morally bankrupt. And we cannot stand in the presence of a holy God on our own two feet. There's not a one of us that's not guilty. But in the same token, in the same moment, we need to understand that God's wrath is not his anger against humanity. God's not mad at you. Let me say that again. God's not mad at you. God's wrath, his anger, is angry against the sin that is destroying all of humanity. So God's not mad at you. He's mad at the sin that you're allowing to destroy yourself. It would kind of be like this. If we're walking down the streets here in Lincoln or or somewhere else, and on the opposite side of the street, we see a large man beating the living daylights out of a young boy, you would tell me that something wouldn't rise up within you? That some kind of righteousness would rise up within you because you're seeing unrighteousness revealed to you right in front of you? If it wasn't wrong, there would be no righteousness. What are you saying? I'm saying that unrighteousness deserves a response. If God's righteousness is the essence of the gospel, then man's unrighteousness represents the rejection or the denial of the gospel message. What do you mean? In other words, when we choose to live in unrighteousness and reject God's offer of salvation through Jesus Christ, we are rejecting the core message of the gospel. It's more about being right with God than all the things in our lives that make us wrong with him. We are all guilty. There's not one of us here in the house or joining us online that can enter a non-guilty plea. We're all guilty. We all fall short of, the, uh, of what God has perfected in the gospel. We all fall short of that on our own accord. On our own measure. But see, here's the deal. Before we can ever seek forgiveness, we must be honest with ourselves and admit that we are guilty in the first place. I believe from these verses of Scripture that we've walked through today, not only can we learn that we are all guilty, but number two, we all need to show empathy. Let me explain. Verses two, verse, chapter 2, verse 1, the first part of that says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man. Every one of you who judges. We see judgment everywhere in our culture today. 
I mean, who's not guilty of judging? Why are they wearing that? Why do they shop at that store? I mean, if you're a sports fan, you're definitely judgmental at one time or another. How can you say that with such confidence? Because I'm a sports fan, and I've been guilty myself. You know, we're all the armchair, armchair quarterbacks. We're watching the games when it comes to football season. We're like, why in the world did they run that play? That makes no sense. And we're saying, if I could just text the offensive coordinator, I'd just let him know. And if he could text back, maybe he'd just tell us. You know, we actually practiced that play 57 times this week, and it worked 56 out of 57. I'm sorry the one time that we tried it in a game, it didn't work. But I mean, you get my point. We're all ready to judge somebody else without knowing their full context. Or what? Without realizing what they are going through. But we post, we shout, we all, we're all ready to declare what we are against. And we fall into the same boat as the religious people that Paul said, you've done the same. Because when we judge other people's sins, we have to first look past our own to judge someone else's. But can I maybe present a revolutionary idea for us as Christ followers. Instead of judging other people's sins, why don't we start showing empathy for other people that are struggling with sin? And that's really easy for us when we see somebody struggling with the, some of the same things that we struggle with because we get it. We desire empathy in those areas for ourselves. But when we see other people struggling with things that we don't struggle with or we don't understand or we're like, how in the world would you ever struggle with that? That doesn't make sense to me. Instead of casting judgment of why are they struggling with that, they shouldn't be struggling with that, or looking down upon them, how about we say, you know what, the same Jesus that saved me, the same Jesus that forgave me of all of my sins, he can forgive you and I'm willing to walk a journey of life with you as well. I believe as a church, I believe as Christ followers, we owe it to the world around us to stop letting them know what we're all against and let them know that we're for them. I'm not saying that we should look past sin. I'm not saying that we should get away from Scripture. That's not what I'm saying, but we should be the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus that sometimes we create in our own minds and self. And show some empathy. There's things that I struggle with. There's also things that I will never struggle with. It's, it's, it's not a temptation for me, but that doesn't give a right to me to, to cast judgment on somebody that struggles with things that I don't struggle with. I believe through these scriptures we can see that we're all guilty. I believe through the passage that we have walked through today, we can see that we need to show empathy because we all are guilty. And number three, I believe from these scriptures today we can learn that we all have a choice. I know some people believe that we don't, but I believe scripture shows us that we have a choice in the matter. Because in verse four it says God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. If you don't have a choice in the matter, there'd be no reason to repent. But all of this gospel, all of this good news that Paul is laying out is meant to lead us all to repentance. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the hope of the gospel laid out. That we would turn from our wicked ways. We would turn from our godless ways. And we would walk in alignment with God, what God teaches in his word. It is so simple yet so complex that we all have a choice. But God will let you choose the wrong path. That proves that he gives you a choice. We, we see it laid out in these verses today. Verses 21 through 24, people exchanged. They chose the truth. They exchanged the truth of God for lies. What does it say? God gave them up. He let them choose. They're idols. People exchange the truth of God for a lie. So God gave them up. He let them choose to worship the creation over the creator. Verses 26 through 31, people exchanged natural sexual practices for the unnatural. So what was God's response? God gave them up to choose that. 
When we exchange or choose our own way, God's response will be the same. He will give you up and let you choose the wrong way. The the gift of eternal life is free. Hence the word gift. In the essence of a gift, what do you have to do to get the gift? You have to receive it. You have to choose to receive it. And I understand this more and more as a parent every day. Let allowing your kids to choose. I understand when you know we bring them from home from the hospital and it's it's simple but yet complex. But when it comes to their, their choices, they're not making a lot of choices on their own. I mean, if they're crying, they're either dirty or they're they're hungry, you know, and you're you're not getting a lot of sleep and you make a lot of crazy de- decisions at that period of your life because of sleep deprivation. Maybe that was just me. But anyways, they start growing up and they start making choices and it's kind of fun you know it's like this is what I want to wear to school or this is what I want to eat and then they start becoming a teenager and they're like actually this is what I believe and this is what and you're like whoa this is what I want to do dad you know this is not this is cool this is not cool and as much as Kelly and I are trying to treat uh, teach our daughters the truth to try and to show them in God's word what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. At some point in their life, they're going to have to choose for themselves what they believe. And how much more as our heavenly father, when he, he sets back and he allows us to choose. I don't see it as a heart of a judge. I see it as a heart of a heavenly father that's pleading. I gave my son as a sacrifice So that you did not have to experience the penalty of your sins for an eternity. All we have to do is repent and turn from those sins and walk after Jesus. But still people today choose to continue to walk in the opposite direction of what God is calling them to do. But the goodness of God, that's not what he wants for us. The goodness of God was revealed through the sacrifice of Jesus. But the choice is ours. Do we choose the goodness of God or do we choose to suppress the truth and believe a lie and put up all the things in our lives that we want to worship other than God? Or do we lean into the goodness of God? Can I tell you about the goodness of God? It's like an ocean with no shore. The goodness of God is like a mountain with no summit. It's like a road with no end. It's not insufficient, but it is sufficient. It's not limited, but it's limitless. It's not just enough. It's more than enough. The goodness of God, the will of our Heavenly Father, and Paul presenting the gospel, the good news, It's the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God that has brought all of us to this moment today. Whether you're in the house or you're joining us online, the goodness of God has brought you here. And as as a Christ follower, if you're here today, I believe the message that we can glean from Paul's teaching in the book of Romans is simply this. That yes, we are all guilty and maybe we need to be reminded of what God has saved us from. So that when we see other people struggling, we're not quick to judge, but we're quick to show empathy. Make sure to hit that subscribe button below and turn on notifications for our YouTube channel. That way you'll be notified when we post more life-giving messages and go live for our weekend services. Thanks for watching.